thank you all for hanging in there till the end. Um, uh, we've heard a lot of things today from the global trends down to family business structures. Um, I'm going to take us back uh, more to sort of economic management and farm management, but a lot of what I'll talk about will, um, will be relevant to climate change. Most of the things I'm going to discuss around dual purpose crops and their management um, are going to help you uh, if any of those changes are going to hit mixed farming, um, dual purpose crops and some of the management strategies around them are going to be moving you in the right direction to deal with those sorts of things. So there's really two key messages. I, I knew this was going to be late in the day, so I thought I'd put my key messages up first. Um, whether you're going to graze the crop or not, selling it on time and even selling it early is going to be the platform for success. You need to be prepared to do that. Early sowing systems require preparation. But it's all about targeting the optimal flowering window for your crop on your farm. So you do need to know what is the optimal flowering window uh, on my farm. Once you know that, you can target crop types and crop varieties to hit that window. It's not a day or two days, it's a, it's a period, but it, you need to know it. And that's the case whether you graze it or not. Um, and secondly, once you've set up that uh, early sowing system, then of course dual purpose crops make sense if you're on a mixed farm. If you can take biomass away from the crop and not have any impact on yields and you can make money out of that biomass, then it makes sense. And the fact is, Australian crops in many areas produce far more vegetative leaf biomass than they're ever going to need to fill the grain that you're going to be able to grow. So it's just excess to the requirement of the crop. If you can turn it into money, um, that's what it's about. They also help you to manage risk and be more flexible on these farm. So just going back to that optimal flowering period. So here's a couple of examples of the optimal flower, flowering period for wheat. Long term, um, here's Tamora, sorry, and here's Condoblin. So they're different, they're different in different places. It's not a single day, it's a period, but over the long term, based on the weather in those places, there'll be a period where yields will be optimised by trying to get the crop to flower then. It's not just determined by frost and heat, it's mostly determined by water availability. The timing that water becomes available to the crop and how that crop turns water into yield. So it's determined by a lot of things, but it can be identified um, and, and targeted with the varieties you sow and when you sow them. It's, it's fundamental to know that. So for example, if um, you know the optimal flowering period for wheat in a particular area is around this period in September, you've got a lot of options of different crops to sow, depending on when you get a sowing opportunity, to hit that same flowering period to optimise the yield. Um, winter wheats can be sown earlier, um, slower maturing spring wheats a bit later, shorter wheats, and there's a range of canola varieties that and barley varieties uh, and other crop varieties where the same thing goes. Now, for, for various crop physiological reasons, crops that are sown earlier um, will tend to have a high yield potential. And that doesn't mean the year will allow you to see that potential, but you'll set them up for a high yield potential. But not all areas have the season length to be able to grow these varieties and not all seasons. But if you get an early sowing opportunity and you can use it, then um, that sets you up very well. So why do these crops have this different adaptation. Um, I apologise if you already know this, but the reason wedge tail, so this is the sowing date and the flowering date. So you can see wedge tail, here's that optimal sowing window I showed you around September. Um, so let's say we want our wheat to flower in that period. You can sow wedge tail anytime, right back into March, it will still flower in that window. And it's because wedge tail's got a vernalisation requirement. It must experience a certain period of cold of minimum temperatures before it will be triggered to flower. That's how, that's how the plant gets away with it. Um, Eagle hawk doesn't have that. Eagle hawk doesn't have any vernalisation requirement. It's not looking for any cold. But what it does require is quite long days. Jance, on the other hand, and a lot of the other varieties, Gregory and, and varieties that are quicker, just require a fairly short a moderately short day length to make them flower. So that will be sown well into May, um, so the days are already short enough so they don't rush into flower. So just to summarise that, 
wet sail's got a cold requirement gene, it must experience a certain number of days below a certain temperature or it will not flower. Um, once it's achieved that, it's then looking at the day length. When the days get to the right length, it flowers. Eagle Hawk doesn't have the cold requirement, but it needs long days. Jams just needs reasonably long days. And that's what determines in these wheat plants when they flower in relation to the sowing day. And canola, the same goes for the winter canola varieties versus the spring canola varieties. So I'd just like to take you back to some outcomes from the Water Year Sufficiency Initiative, which Central West Farming Systems incidentally did some great work in this area. Of all the areas in Australia, the Central West is the place where storing summer moisture to grow crops is the most important. The biggest proportion of your grain yield of anywhere in Australia comes from water you can store in the summer. Um, I'm from the Darling Downs, we've, we've always had to store water, but in southern Australia, I think for a while we, we didn't realise how valuable it was. And in a whole lot of experiments around southern Australia, we showed that if you had strict summer weed control over your summer fallow, and particularly control, uh, don't let weeds grow, you could store an extra 37 mils of water and 44 kilos of them. That's from 20 field experiments um, done around the place. And in the Central West, that was the most obvious. And Colin Master and Central West did a lot of that work in this area. Once you set that paddock up with that extra water and nitrogen, you then have an opportunity to sow earlier, if you get the opportunity to sow earlier. And what climate change has done, climate change is taking away our water rainfall that we used to sow on. It's hard in the last 15 years. The summer rainfall is still there. So increasingly we're going to have to use the summer rainfall to establish our grain crops and not wait for a break. If the break's not coming anymore like it used to. Um, and if you can sow early, but with a variety that still flowers at the same time, you're not, you're not increasing your frost risk, you're not, you're not running into any issues, you just set yourself up for a high yield potential. For a whole range of reasons. Um, you might have to change the management, put it onto some wider rows, hold back the nitrogen, sow it at lower density. You need to manage that biomass um, so it doesn't uh, use too much water too quickly. But getting it in early will set it up for a much higher water use efficiency and a much higher yield. If you start sowing earlier on a farm, if you've got a 20 day sowing program and you start earlier, well, you'll finish earlier. So just by sowing a couple of paddocks earlier, the whole program moves earlier. Every paddock increases in water use efficiency and potential yield. And some of our modelling suggests that you can increase whole farm wheat yield by starting a few paddocks earlier um, quite significantly. So it has a knock-on effect across the farm. Here's just one example of an experiment, a pretty tight year, 177 mils of growing season rainfall in June in 2012. Here's a longer season um, spring wheat, eagle hawk, sown on the 18th of April. Um, Bowlack a bit later, and here's the traditional you know, mid-May Lincoln. Okay, um, four tons, this one yielded four tons, this one yielded 5.9 from a season that we had stored moisture, we controlled the summer weeds. Um, so that, from business as usual, um, to, to this, a yield increase of 0.6 to 1.9, 562 bucks per hectare more in gross margin. And why? The roots were deeper, we stopped evaporation and put more of the water through the plant, and we were trading water for carbon in a much more efficient time of the year before things got hot. So that's, that's how this works. And so at the whole farm level, here's a sort of typical, so here's your sowing date again, and there's your grain yield. A Gregory sown early is gonna suffer if you sow it too early. So you don't sow Gregory until um, early May generally. But Bolac, the longer season wheat that hangs on a bit longer, still flowers at the right time, um, has this higher yield potential from earlier sowing. So if you start your farm program in the middle of May, wait for the break, so in May, um, here's your average yield potential from that variety, if that's all you've got in your silo. If you start earlier um, with these slow varieties and, and start a 20-day program, you're finishing here and your average yield it, it is increased significantly. So that's, um, that's the opportunity. And the good thing is, if you sow wheat early um, and you're having it fly at the right time, you will get a chance to graze it in the winter without affecting the yield. So whether you're on the tablelands and you can grow a Manning or a Revenue or a, or a Hyola 971 canola sown in way back in February or March and get this big period of grazing, 
still have a flowering at the right time and harvest, or whether you're on the slopes, or whether you're further out here um, looking at uh, more traditional crops. Um, these crops almost always, as I said, produce more biomass than the spring will allow them um, to, to turn into grain. So you can take some away, you can graze it, and not lose any yield. Um, I hear you say, but I don't want to put sheep on my cropping country. Well, we, we've done four or five years of, of, um, of studies to try and determine that if we put sheep on control traffic, no-till um, system, we set it up specifically for this. The, the experiment's still going in Pondo and Tamora. Um, and whether you just graze the stubble or whether you graze the stubble and the crops, uh, we measured everything in the soil, water infiltration. We've not been able to find any effect of that grazing after we're up to about the sixth year now. In fact, in some seasons, grazing that material turns it into nitrogen a lot more quickly and makes it available for the following crop and we sometimes get higher yield. Um, so, provided you leave sufficient residue on the soil to protect the soil surface, at least 70% cover and increase water infiltration, you're not gonna do damage to your soil. So sheep actually damage the soil with their mouths, not with their hooves. It's when you overgraze that you do the damage to the soil. So here's just um, a few of the options, as I said, you know, traditional tablelands, stuff that you can sow right back in February or March. I mean, you, you can do that out here as well, but the problem out here is that some of these winter crops take a long time to finish at the other end. Wedge tail doesn't, but some of the winter types hang on a long time because they're waiting for long days. Um, so you've got to be careful what variety you, you select to talk to your agronomist or consultant. But um, you can get a lot of grazing off these and still, uh, still generate a lot of yield. Moving out onto the slopes with more with the wedge tiles, and I know people are grazing wedge tile in this area, or with some of the uh, spring canolas, you can do it as well. Again, um, it's shorter now, slightly less shorter grazing period, but um, still opportunities to graze the crop. And even with spring types like Gregory um, and, and spring canolas, you can sow them on time or a little bit early, graze them and still recover yield. And um, if you're down there, here's just a couple of examples from very dry situations. Um, not this year wasn't so bad. In, in, these are both in Wagga. Uh, but 350, we got 196 grazing days, DSC grazing days off that, and there was really no effect on yield of, of these three different canola varieties. Here's a really dry season, um, sown a bit later, 462 days of grazing, and and um, the ungrazed yielded half a tonne, but so did the grazed. But we had 462 days of grazing, which was, which was pretty handy that season. Um, so it's still possible in short seasons to get valuable grazing. So I don't have time to go into all of the technical agronomic um, information about how to manage this. I'm sure there are people in the audience who are grazing crops and doing it well. Um, but, but there are things to get right. But look, the most important thing is not to lose yield, um, is not to lose too much yield so that you lose more money than you make on the grazing. And the most important thing there is to lock it up, lock it up at the right time. Now, the first um, rule is the stage of the crop. You don't want to be biting off the reproductive parts. You don't want to be biting off the, the emerging heads of the wheat because once they're gone, they're gone. With canola, you can, as the bud is uh, elevating, and you'll see the bud coming up, if you bite that off, the canola will shoot up more buds, but it'll take a lot of time to regrow those buds and you'll be starting to flower a bit too late. So we recommend to try and take it off before the sheep start taking those buds out. Um, so these are phenological rules that are reasonably easy to follow. But there's also um, residual biomass, and we've been spending a fair bit of time in the last three years trying to get some rules around how much biomass should be leave. So it goes something like this. Um, I've told you to find out and know for your farm the optimum flowering time. Then select the variety and the sowing date that'll hit that flowering time. Whether the sowing is in late March or into May or April, make sure you, you've got the right variety combination. Um, you can start grazing the crop as soon as you, there's biomass there that you need and, and you're not pulling plants out. Um, you can stop it according to um, the animals, the amount of feed there, what, what, you, what, you, what you need. But this is the important thing, when to pull them out. Um, I've, told, I've shown you the phenological rules, but we're also developing now some biomass rules. And the way we do that is like this. If you tell me your target yield, 
and in July you're all putting nitrogen on your crops and so you're used to having an idea in your mind about what your yield target is. So if you tell me, sorry, if you tell me your target yield, I can tell you how much biomass you're going to need at end thesis. A five ton wheat crop needs nine tons of biomass at end thesis. If you need nine tons there and we're standing here, we can use average growth rates for your area to see what residual biomass are you going to need on, on any date here to hit nine tons and get your five tons. Now, I'm not saying you'll get five tons, the spring will determine that, but if that's your target and that's what you're hoping for, we know when to lock up and how much biomass to leave. So it's something like this. This is lock up time. There's a safe period to graze where you can take it down to the boards. I've seen wheat and canola recover from almost their earth policy back here. Um, it's got plenty of time to recover to almost any yield level you're likely to be shooting for. Um, there's an unsafe period where you're grazing way too late, you're taking heads off, you've given it no time to recover. And, and this is a period where, which I call sensitive, where it's not past DC30, the heads aren't coming up, but, but it is going to be sensitive to how much biomass you leave, depending on your yield target. So we've done a lot of work uh, in the last three years trying to define these for different areas. And we do that by going in and sowing crops, grazing them, and then we come in with our mechanical grazers and imagine that you just let them a bit longer or graze a bit harder. So it's all been grazed, but we just add a bit more mechanically to find out what impact that has on recovery and yield. And so here's a wedge tail crop sown in late March. The black one there is the ungrazed crop. This is the biomass. And here's all the different, here's where we put um, sheep on or, or, or um, mechanically grazed to take the biomass down to different levels at different times and you can see the crop recovering, okay? This is the flowering, this is anthesis. And I just told you that a five tonne yield is going to require nine tonnes of biomass at anthesis. So all of these treatments here have got well over nine tonnes. They've got the potential to produce well over five tonnes of yield if that's what the season allows you. So you've been able to take all this off in grazing of these treatments and you're easily going to get your five tonnes. These guys are going to struggle to get five tonnes. Um, but look, the season might only give you three tonnes. You don't, you don't know in July when you're making this decision. If the season turns out to be a three tonne, well, all of these are going to make it and you will have been able to take a hell of a lot more. You've made a bit more money out of this grazing. So this is the trade-off between grain and grazing that we're trying to um, provide some information on. Here's the same for Gregory, so this time it's sown a bit later in May, but we, all, we also did some grazing on Gregory, we're getting you know, 400, 600 DSC grazing days off Gregory, and here it is recovering, all the different treatments recovering, there's your five tonne yield, um, so almost all of these treatments got back to be able to produce a five tonne yield if that's what the season gives you. So to just summarise that, um, um, Here's some data from a crop that ended up yielding 4.8 tonnes, okay? So it's a Gregory uh, crop. It ended up yielding 4.8 tonnes. And I've plotted, it, I've plotted that against how much anthesis biomass it had and whether or not I got a yield penalty. So anything that had more than about nine tonnes of biomass, okay, has, has hit that yield. There's no change in yield. So this is high yield, lower yield than the ungrazed. These ones here, which I took down less than eight tonne, but they, they didn't get back to nine tonnes. This one only had eight at anthesis, and this one only had six. So I clearly grazed them too hard or too late. They didn't get back to the amount of biomass at anthesis they needed to support a five tonne yield. So this is the way we're using the data to, to determine how much biomass you need. And there's the data for Wedgetail in the same year. The Wedgetail yielded about 4.4. But again, you see that the critical biomass required to hit that yield was still around about the eight to nine tonnes. So, so if, we, if we know we need that at our thesis, we can work backwards and, and, and give you some idea when to, of how much biomass you need to leave on different dates when you lock up a crop. And so some of our rules of thumb, and this, this is from around the Greenville area, some of our rules of thumb for wheat is that um, if, you leave, if you've got more than a half a tonne of biomass residual um, at the end of July, you'll have enough in that, in that environment to get back to, to a five tonne yield potential, um, if the spring gives you that potential. Um, if you're going to graze... ...and you can see the stems there, 
Um, you can still keep grazing as long as you don't graze down and the sheep are not taking those off. So if you've got a fair bit of height on the crop and they're just nipping the tops off and you need to feed, um, that's still possible. And so using photographs, we can give people some idea of you know, how much that violence looks like. And so ultimately what we're trying to do is get all this into a little tool, a little Excel spreadsheet where, um, where the grower or the consultant says, well, I'm here, my target yield is four tonnes, I'm on the 30th of July. You look up this and say, I've got half a tonne of biomass. Um, basically, will I get to a five tonne yield potential? And depending on your lock-up time, of course, you're going to need different amounts of residual biomass left. Um, so we're trying to get all of our um, data for wheat and canola at least into a little tool like this. And um, at the moment, we have it out there in the hands of some people just testing it to see how um, accurate it is. And the same thing goes for canola. I haven't shown a lot about uh, canola, but we've got, very, we've got all the same sorts of results for canola. And so, um, if I look at all the data that I could find on wheat and canola, so 134 experiments for wheat and 87 for canola, if I put a value on the forage in winter, and I put a value on the grain, if I take sort of rough prices, what you can see is this is a cumulative uh, probability graph. So on average, this is what happens on average. This is what happens in the 10% of best years, and this is the 10% of worst years. So for wheat, um, if you graze wheat and you follow those principles, you almost always will make money compared to an uh, ungrazed crop because you can take the biomass away, make money out of the animals and not change the yield. In some circumstances, we, were, we did graze too hard, too late, um, and we lost some money. But you can see the potential, a lot of the time, the potential is to make a considerable amount of money above an ungrazed crop. For canola, fewer experiments, and we may have been learning along the way, but you can see canola, the, the, the grain yield, the grain is a bit more valuable, so any yield loss costs a bit more, um, and it may be a bit more sensitive to grazing than wheat. So, you know, but, but look, in a, in a quite a large proportion of years, we also uh, could make reasonable money from grazing canola as well. So that's if you just compare an ungrazed canola paddock or wheat paddock with a grazed canola or wheat paddock, what's the, what money can you make? But of course it has whole farm implications because while the animals are on, off the pastures and on the crops, um, the pastures are bulking up and you're building a wheat to feed that you can go back to in the spring. So that's actually worth something in a mixed farming um, system obviously. And we've done some work in Canberra with where we had big areas of grazed canola, grazed wheat and pasture and while the animals were on the crops we measured what was happening on the pastures and we got considerable pasture spelling benefits. Um, so, so from a whole farm perspective, um, being able to put the animals on the crop in the winter is giving it some benefits. Um, it's allowing you to increase effectively the winter stocking rate, the winter carrying capacity which actually drives a lot of the profitability for the, for the livestock enterprise. Um, and this is a setup we had in Canberra, um, so we, we, we looked at the pasture spelling benefit. By having the canola and wheat in the system, you, you can also move the animals you know, from one crop onto the next, keep them off the pasture for a longer period. Um, the canola is providing a break crop for the wheat. We, we got into this grazing canola initially because in the high rainfall zone, grazing wheats had no break crop and they were just running into grass weeds. They had a horrible mess then and they wanted to go back and establish a perennial pasture. They really needed a break crop and canola can provide that and as it turns out, you can graze the canola as well. In the lower rainfall zone, we got into this because canola was just dropping out of the system because people thought it was risky. If you're on a mixed farm and you can make some money from grazing canola um, up front, it takes a bit of the risk out of it. You can keep it in the system, you can manage grass weeds and, and disease. So um, here's an example of uh, a farmer at Greenthorpe. This is where we had our experiments for the last couple of years, Rod Kershaw, just to show you, you know, the way he uses it. I asked him why, he said, it's for quality feed, is my holding size halves and my stock numbers double. Which, I mean, he's, he's really good at, um, he's really good at uh, saying things succinctly, it's wrong. But this is his program. I mean, he's in an area where he can actually use some of the winter canolas. He, he, he can sow them in March. Um, and he gets a lot of, uh, a lot of um, grazing off those. And the last two years, it with pretty dry springs. We've had soils, stored soil moisture. 
pretty scratchy springs the last two years. Those winter canals have matched the spring canals the same later. So it's been really interesting. That's further west than I thought the winter canals might, might have promised, but they've gone really well. He also grazes spring and he, and he grazes uh, Gregory. Um, these are some of the benefits for him. It's reduced his supplementary feeding. Um, the, the main thing I think he said is it just allows him to buy a spring. You know, he's getting those crops in early. It just sets them up so well. If the spring turns dry, they're in a much better position than they would otherwise be. Provided you keep flowering time in the right sort of window, um, you're in a better position to have that there. Um, some of the other places, um, I've just come back from Esperance. Um, this guy farms, I think it's the very last farm along the coast before you hit the Nullarbor Plain, east of Esperance. These guys grow 35,000 hectares of crop and they graze 10,000. Um, they graze, uh, they just graze the whole wheat, just keep moving, it's all cattle. They move the cattle around um, on the crops and then when they come off the crops, they go on the petroploid ryegrass. But he just grazes it all. It's all forage for his, for his cattle. Um, every crop's a pasture. Um, he, he, his, he and his brother are um, uh, doing really well. And he's been able to, I mean, there aren't many innovations in mixed farming where you can increase your crop and your stock um, at, and your livestock uh, at the same time. I mean, often those things are antagonistic. And closer to home, in, where I'm based in Canberra, the guys at, at Goulburn, essentially that was fine wool country. We do fine wool here. You, you can't grow canola here, is what, what Peter heard. Um, and he used to grow fine wool only 10 years ago. And now he's got a whole lot of different um, things going on on the farm. He's diversified quite significantly and doing well again. Much higher, much longer season there, so the, the winter types is what he's using. Um, manning wheat and, and, the, and the, um, the winter canolas. And some of these guys you know, are finding that whole farm profitability is going up around $100 per farm hectare, so not per crop hectare, over the whole farm. This is the sort of, this is the sort of increase that they're, they're getting. Um, so in summary, Dual purpose crops are a, a great mix for a great fit for mixed farms. It's not your whole program, it'll just be a portion of your program, but if you can get some, some crops in early and move your whole sowing program earlier, your whole farm's going to get that sort of knock-on benefit. Please be ready, please talk to your agronomists. There are withholding periods for herbicides. You, you don't want to walk into a mess with weeds, with, with uh, weed control, so clean paddocks or have a have a plan for weed control. Um, Pick the right variety for the sowing time to hit, hit your, your flowering window. Um, and think about the way you can have things coming on and being ready at different times. Because the longer you can keep the stock off the pastures in winter, the more they can uh, bulk up and you'll have that wedge of feed in spring, which will flow into your um, grazing business. When you are locking up, that'll be the most important decision you make. Make sure you lock up on time according to phenology, residual biomass and calendar time. And I think when things go bad, when things go bad, there are options. There's hay options, there's silage options, um, there's options to just graze them out. And to be honest, if, you know, sometimes when you look at the benefit of that in terms of getting on top of some weeds, setting up the paddock for something the following year, um, those, those sorts of uh, options, those sorts of um, circumstances can be looked upon as an opportunity to set up something for the following year. It need not be a disaster. Thank you. Questions?